Today the conversation is with Bill Stewart. Bill is a professor in the Department of Recreation, Sports, and Tourism at the University and a specialist in teaching us how to appreciate our natural areas and how we think of parks. So today's conversation will focus a great deal on parks and park planning and thinking about the differences between our two park systems here in Champaign and Urbana. As always, welcome Bill. Thank you for coming today. Before we get into the conversation about community well-being through park development, uh, where were you born? Betsy, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, I was born in Lansing, Michigan, and I was, uh, went to school in Michigan and in uh, Illinois, and my graduate degrees are at University of Arizona where I was at, lived there in Tucson for about seven years. And I moved to Texas, where I was at Texas A&M University for 10 years. And I've been here in Illinois for, gosh, this is my ninth year. And you were away last year in Canada, right? Yes, I was on sabbatical at University of Waterloo on a Fulbright, looking at uh, healthy community building through park development at University of Waterloo. Well, yeah. you bring a lot to uh, a lot of experience. The uh, department at uh, Texas A&M is a well-known department, and certainly a different uh, climate that you're living in <laughs> now. <laughs> than Texas super hot, and Arizona super hot. What a difference for you! Let's start the conversation with what you uh, focus on and your research and community well-being and talk a bit about that the, so we can lead into some of the other issues we are going to cover today. Yeah, well, uh, in terms of uh, community well-being, I think that I look at community well-being from a, a, a holistic perspective. It, although it's important to have healthy individuals, it's also important to have uh, segments of the community relate to one another in functioning ways that allow for justice and uh, peace and happiness to occur. And many times that, uh, I think through landscape and landscape uh, planning, we can make sure our environments afford those sort of possibilities. Okay, so you have some uh, PowerPoint slides that you have uh, prepared for our viewers. Do you want to bring some of those up sure, yeah. as we uh, talk about some of these issues, the community well-being of everyday life? Yeah, let's oh, do yeah. that then, okay. Patsy. Um, I, I think of the, you'll see on these, uh, on these images, these are images that were actually taken by research participants in studies of mine. I'm actually involved, well, along with my graduate students, with some research of the uh, Urbana Park District Advisory Committee, um, UPDAC, they're called, and I asked them to go out and take pictures of places that were important to their everyday life. And so they came back with a whole slew of really interesting pictures of which I learned a lot about Urbana from. But um, so within the, uh, in these images that you'll see on PowerPoint, each one of them was taken by a participant, and there's a special meaning to these environments that you'll see as Im images. I'm actually not going to go through what the environments mean, um, but uh, it's just to let you know that at each one of these images, someone stopped and reflected and thought this place is meaningful to them for whatever reason based upon their person, their family, or their ties to the community. That's a very interesting approach. So what you're saying is that if you and I were maybe walking down the street side by side and having a conversation, mm -hmm. had cameras in hand, we might take pictures of two entirely different things because of what might catch our eye. Yeah, I think yeah, that's very true. In fact, I think that many times the, um, our, our culture tells us that the idealized landscapes are really those that are uh, linked to the national parks or to wilderness areas, those pure or pristine landscapes and that the places our everyday home and work aren't necessarily framed as idealized or that can be made better. And what this project is really about is to allow community dialogue to occur about what's important and what's special in terms of their heritage or their sense of identity and sense of time with, in this case, Urbana Champaign. This would be um, a really a fascinating uh, approach for some of the neighborhood associations that exist in Urbana mm -hmm. and Champaign to, in one of their group meetings or gatherings, to mm -hmm. send folks out to take pictures of their area where, where the association represents and just to see the differentiation of what these people 
pick out as the key yeah. points that are of interest to them? Uh, well, that's a really good, I think <laughs> it would be good. In fact, I was involved with a study prior to this one in, in Urbana up at Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie. It's just south of Chicago and near Joliet. It's the old Joliet Arsenal. And I was amazed after uh, that study, we had about 20, 25 participants go out and take photographs of important places in their nearby uh, community. Um, at the closeout of that study, I felt like my graduate students and I learned a lot about the places around Medewin. And when I gave a closeout uh, presentation to the community members there, I was amazed at how they were discovering things about themselves that they had not known. They realized that other people felt that some bridge over the Kankakee River was important or some pasture was also important to them. Mm -hmm. And there was a sharing of ideas that in many ways are what I'm going to call a civic discovery or a social learning where the value for that community grew or had the potential to grow mm -hmm. in part because there really aren't any dialogue forums for people to share ideas about why certain places are meaningful to them. And so part of this study, as much as anything, is to facilitate dialogue amongst people who care about their communities and neighborhoods. So it's just the Urbana Park District that you've been working with, not the Champaign Park District That's so far. Right, but I did not limit the uh, UPDAC uh, participants who were in this study. I didn't limit them to uh, just take pictures of Urbana places. I said any place within Champaign County uh, okay. or a nearby uh, within a few miles radius is fine. And I think that as you see some of these images, which I will not talk about or label, but they do come from a variety of different places within a few miles radius of Urbana. That's great. So, yeah. Well, let's look at some yeah, of the okay. images. Yeah, okay, very you good. Um, I think is what, uh, is what I'm trying to champion here is the thought that everyday life is really important. Um, that too often we think of, I guess, uh, landscapes as being those remote, far distant places that other people manage or care about. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to center this on home and workplace. The other thing I wanted to do is to center th this on the notion of a healthy community, that it's not just about, many times health gets medicalized, and so health becomes an issue of um, are you ill or where's your ailments, uh, what sort of surgery are you looking for. Uh, and that's, in my mind, the medicalization of health, it's important, don't get me wrong, but I also think it frames health in a negative way about those special trips to the doctor or other experts. And what this is, I'm curious about how, uh, how people live their life on an everyday basis. And so that's why the instructions to people for taking photographs were one of, uh, think about your everyday life and the environments you depend on and you enjoy and you feel a sense of solace within. Uh, and those special places, take pictures of them, uh, particularly if they help you with connections to your community or your family or your sense of well-being. And so that's the instructions they were given, and I guess this is where this notion of, in my mind, a healthy community is really about uh, uh, identifying and creating those places uh, within our urban planning processes that people are proud of and they can connect with their other community members. Did anybody ever come back and say, it's all so ugly, I couldn't find anything that I could make to. You know, no one's ever done that. I've been amazed at the, actually, the diversity of photographs that people have taken from okay. in terms of the places they find. Um, and I've had some pretty ugly places having people <laughs> taking pictures of, but for some reason that huge parking lot is a site of some event in their history that was very important to them. Okay. Um, I know, for example, up in Joliet, they had a Latino youth program that was meant to, uh, they wanted their Latinos to be, uh, feel a sense of place about Joliet area. And so they noticed that there were a lot of graffitis being written on, being written on the buttresses to railroad overpasses and highway overpasses and underpasses. And they asked them to create stories that they would like other people in the community to tell uh, within murals. And so if you go up to the Joliet area uh, and you have your eyes open, you'll see a lot of murals there that were literally uh, designed and drawn and painted by the Latino youth up there to tell their story of migration from the south to the north. And then their views of what they expected, what they received. Um, and it's sort of a public expression and representation of their cultural identity. As public art. Yes, yeah, public, public art, art. yes. Okay. Uh, but we can also think of landscapes as art or as texts that we can read and interpret. 
and in a little bit here we'll get into the different uh, park districts here, both of which are excellent park districts, Champaign and Urbana, but they have a very different position regarding the way society should connect with uh, nature and landscapes. Okay. So I guess the other thing I wanted to bring out was that health is um, that, that when we think about community health and well-being, it's more than just a sum of individuals' health and well-being. Um, for instance, uh, you can talk about how healthy you are and your well-being, both mental and physical. I could talk about mine. But with, com with community well-being, my whole in community well-being is it's larger than just the sum of our two health and other people who are involved with the community. It's really relational among segments of a community and how well and healthy is this, uh, these relationships between segments of a community functioning. Okay. So when I think that many times parks do have a role to play, in fact several roles to play in representing those relationships be between people within a community. So, All right. Yeah. Um, and I think of the, the um, I won't go into detail here, but the concepts that really I link into, and they're from a variety of different streams of literature, but they're tied to heritage. And just to make it clear what, what I think of heritage, it's, not, it's different than history, where history can objectively be identified as being accurate or valid based upon some sort of uh, um, objective datum that's out there. Heritage is really those things that you and I would think about here and now, about wha what we want to bring with us from our past or our current day to the future. So it's a construction of one's past in many ways. We're, we're looking back to our past and we're saying, what's important to our sense of who we are now? Let's make sure we protect that and bring it forward with us in the future. So in many ways, it's sort of present generation saying ostensibly to the future that these, this was important to us. So that's what heritage is. It's clearly a purposeful and willful construction of what one's past or one, one's community's past has been like. Um, and that comes from a whole stream in architecture and landscape architecture and anthropology and museum studies. Uh, another uh, concept that I think is important has to do with um, this um, a sense of uh, social identity, which is a person or a culture's uh, sort, of, sort of concept of where they come from socially. Uh, it's often tied on race or ethnicity, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it's often linked to cuisine or language. And it has to do with not just the individual, but the individual as they link to their social context of a community. And then the very last concept that I, I uh, link to is one that could be referred to as place. Um, and place as different than space, of course. Space has just the physical parameters of a location is what would be called space. When that's transformed into place, it becomes imbued with meaning. So for instance, if I were to ask you about um, let's say your grandmother's home or, or, or your grandmother, you probably would link your grandmother to her home or her backyard. And you probably couldn't think of your grandmother's backyard without thinking of your grandmother. And that's different than a real estate agent that would go in there and look at the material construction of the house and identify square footage and these objective parameters. Your meanings for your grandmother's house is definitely filled with value. And that's what place is about, it's about how we impose these values on our physical environments. So it's really up here in people's heads where this place is constructed, where identity is constructed, and where heritage is, is constructed. That isn't um, factored in very often. I'm, as you were talking about that immediately, what came to, to mind was when um, the Burnham City Hospital I see. was raised and then this acreage has been sitting there vacant for such a long time and all of the meaning that that building must have had for so many people in the community and that gets wiped out and then this vacant land and what will happen to it next and sure. that's never been part of the conversation. I see, okay. Well, you know, I don't really know much about that redevelopment in Burnham Hospital. And, and I guess that... That happened before you moved here, so... Well, well I, think, I think part of my research, and I've had some people, people suggest that it might be an anti-growth agenda. And I wanted to make it really clear that this is not about anti-growth. It, it's about uh, undifferentiated sprawl and about being able to identify those material things that are meaningful to uh, some segments of a community's sense of who they are and bringing those forward with us to the future. And they can just be vestiges that would be symbolic of meanings of one's past. So 
it wouldn't be that we'd have to stop development of a pasture or a farm field. It would be, it would be to the point where we could somehow provide for a growth, yet do it still protecting a community's sense of itself, sense of time and place. Okay. Yeah. All right. So those are the three concepts that I link into. And, and I guess what I'd, I'd like to think about is where I center around, because there's a, a lot of different ways to identify what's special in our everyday environments. And I think where my research really links into are those public places, because there's a whole slew of places that uh, are part of a community uh, that could be uh, like the box stores on North Prospect, for example, uh, the um, auto stores, the grocery stores, those sorts of things. But I think of them as being largely private places. And what my research is about is that there should be a public representation of uh, that should signal community well-being. And so when I think about public places in a community, and you, we could probably brainstorm here, Patsy, and talk about well, what are the public places within Champaign-Urbana, um, we probably couldn't get much more than 10 fingers with public places. Once you get past the streets, the sidewalks, the churches, and even churches, are they public or, well, they're sort of quasi-public. Mm -hmm. The schools, well, certainly the schools are public, but you tend to only go to those schools that are your children's or your mm -hmm. uh, 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 acquaintances' uh, mm -hmm. ch children's schools. Um, and before you know it, we get, we, we get down to reduce that there really aren't many public places in a community. Besides, let's say, the parks, they're definitely a public place, and maybe plazas, but often plazas are owned by a corporation, and they're meant to signal a certain uh, sense of who that corporation's about. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that's not healthy and it's not contributing to a community's sense of who they are, but really the, the publicly owned land that's, uh, that decisions are made for the entire health of a community are the places that I'm most concerned about within my research. And so I tend to acknowledge public places I tend to recognize that there are important private places that we all go to on a daily basis, but I'm really about the publicness of a community. And so that's why I fo focus on community land as because it's often framed as a park is what these public places are. But the decision of what happens to that park is made by a very select group yeah. mm -hmm. of people, usually a very small park board, members of which might have be on the sure. board for decades. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sure. That's an excellent point, uh, Patsy, that there's no doubt the uh, park board and the advisors to the park board are meant to reflect citizen values. Sometimes they do. Um, mo I would say most of the time, at least within my experience, they have really good intentions to represent the entire community. And, but the question remains, do they represent the entire community? And how do they, how do they go about reflecting the community's values? Um, so, but, but you are right that uh, it's sometimes difficult to get people to access public hearings for land use change because often when you think about a land use change, and let's bring up the uh, issue of uh, the Walmart that recently was proposed in Urbana. And I went to one or two of those hearings and people came to the Walmart hearings prepared to fight either for or against Walmart. They weren't there to talk about what their sense of community was necessarily that could have come out as a byproduct within the conversation, but they were really there to make an argument why the Walmart should be allowed or why it should not be allowed. And the conversation was really constrained. The boundaries were put around those, those comments based upon if they were for or against Walmart. And I think what I'm, tr I'm trying to do, at least with this research, has to do with uh, abstracting it from any particular contro controversy and ask people in the, in the neutral space of their own life, um, what's important to them. That, I, I just, a couple of things just really leaped to mind. Uh -huh. Wouldn't it be fascinating to use the public planning process method of a charrette with mm -hmm. these cameras, asking people to take pictures of a space that's being proposed for a development mm -hmm. of X mm -hmm. or Y or Z, and getting these people to take pictures of that space and how they would view it and what parts of it are important. And then that result is folded into how the development oh. design yeah. evolves. But that's not the development design process. The development design process is here is the design, 
and here's what's left over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And put some grass seeds yeah, out. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I guess that I've, uh, I've, been, I've uh, witnessed a number of different design processes. And you're right, um, many times there is a preferred alternative. And sometimes there's some options that are identified. Here is some, you know, maybe six options. There's a preferred al alternative where there's more detail and more um, context to be put on that preferred alternative. Um, and often that preferred alternative comes from uh, uh, data or experts that are, I'm going to say, well-intentioned. And they're clearly trying to do best for the community. Uh, we, we, we could say or assume, um, and often they do do well for community. But if you look, let's just say, at the Chicago suburbs, I, I don't go up there a lot, but occasionally I go to Naperville and I need to go through Downers Grove and Oak Brook and Lyle and a handful of other spots that, to be honest, to the unaided eye, they all run together. And so here you have a situation where uh, where we have wonderful developers that I'm sure were paid a lot of money for their fees and did a great job in many ways. But sometimes planners uh, uh, can look at planning as being an infrastructure development process of where to lay the roads, the pipes, the wires, and that's extremely necessary. So we need people that do that. But they forget about what the communities could be the over sight of what the community is about and what's meaningful about this place it needs to give it a sense of time to uh, preclude undifferentiated growth from occurring and so i guess that's where i would like to think that this process could be plugged in uh, to be uh, more of the start of the initial phase of a planning process before there's been any designs drawn on paper before there's been any pipe or roads speculated upon where they should be going. Something like this might be a, where this type of research would plug in the best. It, it, that's, it, and another thought I had is that it, as an overlay layer of knowledge that's important to have before you start a design process. Mm -hmm. Don Kiefer joined me in a conversation a couple of weeks ago and the purpose of inviting him is because to talk about what's under the surface of the earth. Oh, I see. He's okay. a, he's somebody from Water Survey, and that's something that we don't think about a lot. When we're covering, you know, the surface of the earth, we don't think about what's percolating down to this wonderful water that we have in our, our area. So we're talking about that, and so there's a layer that we have to be thinking about. Now you've added another layer that we should be thinking about as we're moving forward in the sure. design process. So that's really rather fascinating and something I had not not thought about before. I see, sure. And, and I guess that uh, this could be framed as this another thing that planners need to do to get their, um, to I guess, link to community issues of justice and uh, good planning. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But I tend to think that, uh, like uh, Mr. Kiefer, that this type of research, in my mind, is another way to, let's say, democratize the decisions that are made and to look for visions and values within your community that's already living there. So in that sense, it definitely does privilege those people that are there currently. And it allows them to speak and allows them to give voice, where otherwise they may be intimidated by speaking at public hearings or other forums where they uh, have a number of experts with their charts and graphs and who am I to come up and say something about that lot next door? Really, rather than being a parking lot or a theater, it should be just be left as a bird sanctuary rather than the lot next door. <laughs> to take this even further, uh -huh. uh, I just received the announcement of the final grand community meeting for the visioning process that's going on in Champaign County. It's going to be held at the Assembly Hall. They're expecting a lot of people. And throughout this year's process, None of us were turned loose with cameras <laughs> to take pictures of areas within the county that we have a strong relationship. We've made lists of things and sure. goals and priorities, but this was never part of that very sure. long I see. Yeah. process and another, another place where it would I have see. been just fascinating to capture some of these ideas that you're working with in your research. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that you should bring that up, Patsy, because I guess what this type of research does 
it not only asks what's out there in terms of values and why is it meaningful, but it asks the question, whose values are these? And I think that many of us are taught in our sciences and other places that, well, let's debate the ideas and let's not worry the source of the ideas. And what this research does, it definitely humanizes the ideas. Right. These meanings and values are linked to people and to their uh, culture groups. Mm -hmm. right. And that we need to know whose meanings they are. And their voices can represent themselves better than anybody can. So I guess that a, a number of planning processes that I've been involved with um, there, there is tendency to be this, uh, uh, this deconstruction of people from the meanings that they bring to bear in planning. And it's done for purposes that I can understand. So I'm not saying this particular mode of research fits all planning processes. I'm basically uh, saying that there's been a movement to democratize all decision making that are, is publicly oriented across environment, health, education. Uh, you name the public sphere of uh, of, of relevance, even to defense. And there's a movement across all of that to, to flatten the structure of, and, and make decision-making forms more accessible. Mm -hmm. And so I think of park planning and land use d development is just being another one of those windows into the way policy is moving in this country. So I, I, I think that what this research is meant to do as another way to frame it is it helps facilitate the shift from expert-based to citizen-involved planning. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So, so I might go on with, yes, please with do. a few things here. that, um, And I guess that, that, that I'm thinking of these parks as being places that do represent our heritage, but you know, whose heritage are, who is the our in this heritage? Right. And so th 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 these issues of reflecting social values or providing senses of place and identity, um, parks can have the capacity to, to do that. And I think that where, what I wanted to bring out here, because I think in part what I'm, fighting in my research, and we all have our baggage that we bring to our research. My own baggage is that there's this, that we have a dominant discourse or a dominant culture that's out there. And largely, environmental debate is framed as use versus preservation. Should you use something or should you preserve it? And that framing of the debate is really a passe framing that needs to be buried with the last century because it no longer does justice to what the issues are. But I just wanted to build up these two values or visions, just so that uh, that you and I and, and viewers can bring in what are these ideologies that are represented in landscapes. So, if you have patience with me, just sure. for a couple couple minutes here, Go on. There, there's these two. There's largely there's two values that are out there in American culture. One's called the progressive value, which is really where the roles for human in this progressive value is really to make the land better. Well, if you make a land better, it must start off worse. So it was at one point a wasteland or an unproductive swamp or something that was not useful to people. I mean, mm -hmm. like when they tiled here. Yeah, when they tiled yeah, here. here. Okay. Um, or I know when uh, a wonderful man who I really appreciated, uh, Bob Tolson, the former executive director of the Champaign Park District, who I have immense respect for, when uh, I first came here and he uh, uh, gave me a tour of West Side Park, the beginning of his story was this place, what, what was at one time, a swamp. And you sort of know the end of the story because through humans, through the park district, they made West Side Park into this beautiful place now with a prayer for rain statue uh, and fountain with many different uh, pockets of places for people to recreate and to enjoy the peacefulness of nature, including some statues and an art garden. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the progressive value is really the farmer mentality. Where, uh, and it's based upon the value of utility that, human, that humans in society makes things better. Uh, and so it takes an environment from being a barren wasteland through human ingenuity and hard work, we make it better into a garden. It's quite different than the tragic narrative, which is really a story that starts off with a fragile ecosystem that's pure, pristine, untainted, undeveloped. And through human uh, involvement, we disrupt and interfere. The golf disaster. Okay, yeah. As a, as a mega example There you of go. That. Okay, that's a good example. Right. So hu humans really can do nothing but to bring down an otherwise idyllic landscape that was a native ecosystem of some sort. And those are largely the two values that are out there in our dominant discourse that have had 300 years or more to develop. Okay. So what we're talking about here in terms of bringing out individuals and cultural and subcultural groups' values, 
they're fighting a cultural battle that's been, uh, that's been won by these two dominant values for 300 years. But nonetheless, we never give up hope that there's ways to pluralize our culture and to bring these values to the visibility for part planning purposes. So, and just to make sure that these values, these dominant values are known out there, I wanted to identify two landscape paintings, and they're largely based upon the Dust Bowl. And th th there were actually two books that came out in the late 1970s. And these two books um, were written by eminent historians um, that were, they were based on largely the same set of facts, but their conclusions could not have been more different regarding what happened in the Great Plains in the 1930s. This first one is a progressive narrative, and it's illustrated here by Grant Wood's painting in 1931 of Fall Plowing. And I think that this illustration of Grant Wood largely shows a progressive story, where there is this, um, the plow, of course, is in the foreground of this painting, the perp and that's the cause of this beautiful landscape, this well-ordered landscape that's productive, that yields fruits and vegetables and grains for all of America. So now, of course, this story started with this barren wasteland, or maybe it started with raw materials, was the start of this story. Through human ingenuity, it developed into this wonderful uh, uh, fall landscape. And that's, that's quite a different narrative than the tragic narrative of the American Dust Bowl, which really starts off uh, as this, uh, a wonderful ecosystem. But as you can see, see there, the plow in the foreground, much like Grant, uh, and, and this, by the, by the way, is Alexander Hogue's Mother Earth Laid Bare. Um, the, the plow there in the foreground um, is the cause of literally the rape of Mother Earth. Um, and there you have a barren wasteland with an abandoned farm in the background. Uh, and it's due to commercial agriculture. So it's a very different stories. Um, these paintings illustrate, I think, the two books. Uh, one was written by Paul Bonifield. It came out in 1979 called The Dust Bowl. Another one by Donald Wooster, 1979, called Dust Bowl. <laughs> almost the exact same title, drew on the almost the exact same facts, and they couldn't come across with such uh, different starts of the story, middles of the story, and ends of the story. So that's why I bring values are really uh, ideologies about nature that we bring with us and that are in our, our noggins. But I'd like to transition now into the two park districts we have. Um, I think of Champaign Park, uh, park, district, park district, uh, district is really representing this progressive narrative about community and land. If you look at their website, um, the Sholem Aquatic Center is their latest uh, thing that they champion, and it truly is a wonderful aquatic center. Uh, they've got some uh, nice uh, new pool there with all sorts of uh, dumping buckets and things that chil children eight and under could uh, play in. Uh, there's a lap swimming uh, place for 25 yards, and there's a lazy river with slide. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a notion, and with flower gardens throughout it, with a nice sort of nautical motif. Um, of, uh, of uh, fencing and a uh, beautiful garden. It's a high fence around it, but the garden is in the inside of this aquatic center. And so here, this, uh, in my mind, this aquatic center symbolizes this notion that through human ingenuity, it always gets better. In fact, if you actually look at their website, they're as they have some leftover money. They're asking uh, people, they're taking a poll of people in Champaign, what can we add to the aquatic center to make it better? And what would you suggest? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd have to see what the citizens of, of Champagne think. Okay? okay, I'm not sure what the citizens of Champagne think at this point. Uh, my research really is focused on Urbana in Urbana Park District, but uh, it's just I guess that's telling that the uh, Champagne Park District, though, with their leftover funds, are still hoping and l moving in the direction of making their park, uh, Shulam Aquatic Center, better. They need to have a charrette <laughs> and pull the, the community uh, together on one day and discuss <laughs> what to do <laughs> and have a public planning process. Well, you, well, you, well, well yeah, you, uh, <laughs> they did have a, plan, a public planning process. Uh, whether or not it was grounded and whether or not it, uh, uh, they heard the community voices, um, those are issues that are left for speculation and for, uh, I guess, uh, assessment. Um, but this, but, Sh but Champaign is quite different than Urbana Park District. And what I'm showing here, this is not to say that Champaign has better values in Urbana or vice versa. I don't mean to say that Champaign Park District is wrong or right and Urbana is wrong or right. These are just different values of how to represent ideology in landscapes. 
okay? So where Champaign had a lot of, uh, they're building a new pool, a new aquatic center, they championed their little pocket parks with their signs that say Champaign Park District next to them. Uh, these gardens, carving a garden out of this wild place. Uh, Westside Park was at one point a swamp that is now a nice garden. Uh, Urbana Park District is actually quite different where they, their, their latest uh, claims to um, fame and they're proud, proud of has to do with the Judge Weber site. You've got uh, two slides here on your screen that show the, the Judge Weber site. But you know, for some people who aren't as um, familiar with our community, oh, yeah. why don't you identify just roughly where the, the water yeah. park in Champaign is located? Oh yeah, the Sholem Aquatic Center is uh, on a Crescent Drive in Kirby. If you know where the, it, you, it's actually where the old uh, Sholem pool was, that was a 50 meter pool that was torn down to build the uh, slide, the lazy river, the 25 yard pool uh, for laps, and the uh, kitty playing area. Okay. 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 Um, and the Judge Weber Park from Urbana um, is over on Perkins Road. Um, it's where the doggy park uh, is, uh, at least I think that's the uh, vernacular name of that park. Um, it's by the old, the Archery Club has a site that's there where they shoot bows and arrows. Okay. And there's a, uh, I can't remember the name of the trailer, trailer park that's close there. But if you go up north on Cunningham Road, uh, you come to Perkins Road, just turn right there and you'll come into contact with the doggy park. And right behind the doggy park is what I'm calling the Judge Weber site. Okay. The name has yet to be identified, um, but that's where this park is. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is where Westside Park was once a swamp and Champaign Park District made it better through making it a garden and a fountain, uh, sh sh the Urbana Park District, my guess is, has designs to make this uh, Judge Weber site into a restored wetland, i.e. a swamp. So here the roles for humans are to restore back to a native ecosystem into what this place was at one time. And so it's a value that respects history and and the, the history they want to respect here is the natural ecosystems of Illinois. And interestingly, the university now is sort of combining both of these approaches because they are creating a wet garden. Okay. <laughs> now near Allen Hall where those oh, yes, retention yes, right. ponds are on yes. the campus. That would be right behind McKinley Health Center. Close to Illini uh, Grove. Close to Illini Absolutely. Grove. So this yes. is sort of emerging a little bit of what it you're is. talking about. Yes. Uh, the Champaign-Urbana Park District approaches. Very much so. In fact, if you look at the uh, past designs of the uh, and the history of the campus master planning for landscapes, uh, much of the planning was uh, more of the farmer mentality with the straight lines, the rows, a very much a cultivated garden uh, where things got better due to the human uh, ingenuity to um, uh, cultivate. Mm -hmm. And the university though is moving into what could be called a sustainable campus plan and that involves uh, landscaping and shrubs that are more perennial and more native to the area but it's far beyond just the native use of native plants. It has to do with designs. Uh, it has to do with what to do with flood water. Um, and it's really much more comprehensive uh, than past plans, landscape plans have been. Where past landscape plans have, li have virtually been about what plants to put in. The uh, current landscape planning process for a sustainable landscape of the campus has to do with to inc incorporate um, not only the use of shrubs and plants uh, as native, but also uh, what to do with wastewater, transportation planning, it's uh, buildings and building design, passive use of uh, uh, a positioning of uh, a building on a site. It's, it's much more uh, robust of a landscape planning process. So I'm really proud of the university for moving in that direction. Yeah, and part of it, let's face it, part of it might be economically driven, which is fine. But I think another part of it is ideologically driv driven too. So there's a lot of good reasons. It's, it's, it's a very complex to identify what's the one right reason you'd go in this direction, but let's just say there are multiple benefits of m moving into uh, a planning process like this, and particularly one that would deal with restoration of, in this case, swamps and wetlands. Uh, not to slip past the economic aspect okay, yeah. uh, of it, there really is an economic aspect uh, to it from the perspective of this type of landscape design and saving the cost of infrastructure mm -hmm. because you can minimize 
so much infrastructure that would otherwise sure. need to yeah. to be put in and in the oh, long absolutely. run that is a sort of a public works yes. saving for a city or a big mm -hmm. corporation and things of that nature so that's a good point that you Patsy that is so true I mean I there are so many times when I have spoken with planners uh, and other uh, I guess officials that are in charge of park planning or transportation planning or some seg segment of community planning and um, many of them do realize the economic benefits of sustainable development in the way of bringing in floodplain or transportation planning but some of them don't uh, and I'm, I'm always amazed particularly with let's say transportation sustainable trans transportation planning which usually calls for more bicycle pathways or multimodal ways that people get around from mass transit to cars to pedestrian to bicycles. And the first thing that comes out of many people's mouths is, oh, it's too expensive to build those bike paths. And my immediate response is, well, let's compare a bike path to building a new road. Um, and what's more expensive, road, road building the first time and road maintenance or a bike path? The other thing I'll add is that for most part with a city that's already been built like Champaign-Urbana, you can get a lot of mileage out of already built roads through traffic calming techniques, through one-way and local traffic only development. A sustainable transportation development, from my own view, there are a lot of options that really take as much money as it takes to put up signs and get the community on board with that process. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's around 5% of the people in mid-sized urban areas like Champaign-Urbana that ride their bicycle. And what I'm not about is in planning is to make everyone get out of their bicycle, get off their cars and ride bicycles. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just, imp, you know, have 15 to 20 percent of the people in Champaign, in Champaign Urbana at some point each week ride their bicycle to where they work? That would alleviate a lot of our transportation planning problems. And in my mind, it'd be a very inexpensive way of solving some potentially very expensive problems. It would be. Yes, and, and and also if they're well designed, you know, the field of dreams mm -hmm. syndrome. Sure. If yes. they're well designed, then people might feel more comfortable riding their bike because if you're not a strong, aggressive sure. bike rider, you might feel a little bit uncomfortable on uh, the lack of design yeah. pathways right. at, yeah. that we presently don't uh, have. Absolutely. And Safety is a it big up. issue, right? Is what is what this is is moving the cities away from accommodating bicyclists and pedestrians to encouraging bicyclists mm -hmm. and pedestrians. In my mind, America's had what a, a century of encouraging automobiles. Shouldn't we have ten years of encouraging pedestrian and bicycling? Right now, in my mind, most cities accommodate those mode of uh, those transportation styles. And believe me, I appreciate the accommodation committed bicyclist myself. Yes, so I was just saying, <laughs> <laughs> but being truthful here, Bill <laughs> rode his bicycle over. Yes. <laughs> but I think that um, beyond accommodation, there's a lot more that could be done. And right now, I think it's, I'm not going to say tokenism, but I do think there's so much more that could, could be done on the same level as the enthusiasm and money that's been spent on roadways. Well, to get back to Judge yeah, Weber right, let's and, let's and the dog here. park, one of the things that um, um, again, merging some of your very good comments here uh, and bicycling. Both of these places are um, uh, positioned such in our community that it's sort of death defying to get to them on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Riding your bicycle along Cunningham or North 45, as some people might know it, or if you yes. were heading to Ran Tool, is. Is it's scary. It's a, it's a scary trip. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's wonderful to have Urbana Park District thinking about this, but are there other things that need to go along with this planning to uh, make it easier for people to get to this? Sure. To this spot yeah. on their bicycle. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, well and, and, and let me clarify that uh, this Judge Weber site is really just in the, it hasn't even initiated a, a, uh, a, uh, a site plan, hmm. um, but I, but my from my understanding is that the Urbana Park District would like to make their parks contiguous, so link up the Judge Weber site somehow with the Crystal Lake site, with other sites within, uh, with other park sites, and I also say that I actually admire the Urbana Park District because they're really trying to work with other community. Uh, uh, 
divisions and, and planning processes. So one of the problems with, I guess, park planning is park planners often see, see themselves as only about parks. And I think I, I admire the Urbana Park District because they realize that they're about quality of life and that means that they need to connect with other uh, uh, city officials about planning. It's not to say that that couldn't be improved, but compared to other towns and cities I've been part of in planning, Urbana is uh, a bit ahead of the curve on that. Actually, this is another uh, aspect because some of the conversation uh, that MTD has been having uh, and the county board has been having is how can we service transportation to mm -hmm. the outlying communities? Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking of your comment about how much less expensive it is to create bicycle pathways and sort of merging that thought with creating uh, an emerald necklace mm -hmm. of connecting green spaces with uh, sure. bicycles, that that would be maybe an interesting way to be thinking about solving the transportation sure. between some of these communities and yeah. getting people to the metropolitan areas of Champaign-Urbana from the, the county areas. Mm -hmm. That could that could be a way, yeah. I, I guess it's where where is where my research connects with that, Patsy. It's not so much with what are the design solutions. My research is is really about what are the values that are out there that are worthwhile to represent in a in a city plan. So I guess I'd I'd have to um, uh, to, to to hold back on yes, that's the direction they should go. I I personally believe there's a lot of bicyclists that are out there, and there is a latent demand for safe bicycle pathways in this community. I've never fully done a comprehensive view of a uh, st study of what's needed in Champaign-Urbana by residents regarding transportation, but I do think that there is a, uh, there'd be a lot of uh, prospective and happy bicyclists if they did more to accommodate that here. This would be uh, fun for maybe some of your graduate students to link up with that new bicycle uh, commission that the Urbana City Council has just appointed with Brian oh, Bowersock I see. chairing that and mm -hmm. so they are just at the very beginning of working on how to improve bicycling, the bicycling environment in Urbana. I see. You know, I, I was not aware of this. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm learning something here. <laughs> <laughs> But, but but I wanted I wanted to uh, yes move on continue with Urbana Park District because yes, they please. have another site here called Weaver Park, w in which they just discovered uh, a, a, a remnant grove of oaks that were uh, growing there from uh, a century past. And there's speculation when they found these uh, remnant oaks. There was a lot of speculation about how old old they were when they were planted. Are they attached to the big grove within the larger Urbana context? And the city became quite proud of this particular park area um, because of these old oaks. And you see here pictured on the screen some of these oaks, these ancient oaks that are there. There's also discussion about turning this into a prairie and savanna is linked to these oak trees. And this is located where? Uh, this is on, uh, is it uh, far on, uh, on East Main Street? Okay. Um, is it Smith Road? Right. Is where Weaver Park is. Okay. Next to the, uh, adjacent to the armory. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I think of, he, he, here's a case, I guess I wanted to, just to cl bring closure to the comparison between Champaign and Urbana Park District, where Urbana is really about uh, ideology that represents um, this uh, rest restoration and sense of history in ecosystems, uh, where humans do, uh, uh, where our role is really is to restore the native prairie that was once here. Illinois is, after all, the prairie state, uh, and one third, of one, one third of our state at one time, more than that, was a prairie. It's now down to less than 1%. Urbana takes it upon themselves to represent that, that ideology in their parks. Champaign is really about more improving upon landscapes where humans have a role to make it better. And I guess it's where I wanted to go with this was that, that, that the, the, the issue here is that um, there are so many other ways besides these two values to represent culture and landscape relationships. These are two values that are out there. They're important values that we need to reflect on, but I think there's other values uh, that other cultural segments of the community are not yet represented in Urbana or Champaign Parks. And how would you suggest that being accomplished? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I, I think that um, there's already some good movement underway 
uh, particularly with Urbana, which I'm most familiar with their planning processes in which they're doing, they're undergoing the strategic plan and they're reaching out to some neighborhoods and having neighborhood input. Mm -hmm. And I think that through neighborhood design, they're working with neighborhood groups to revise and tweak the current neighborhood parks that are dotted throughout the city. And uh, the next um, uh, community planning conversation will be with two folks from the neighborhood, the uh, historic East Urbana neighborhood, which is working with the Urbana Park District on Victory Park. I see. Oh, excellent. And th th this is an initiative that came from the neighborhood excellent. approaching Urbana Park I District. See. So that's just a, a, a preview of the, yeah. the next conversation that I'll be having uh, to dwell on that. Excellent. You brought several books that excellent. I don't want our conversation to end before we talk about those. I'll hold them up while you... Yes, I, I did, uh, Pat, I see. If anyone's interested in, uh, I guess, landscape values and, and, and issues that deal with heritage and sense of place um, in, in American culture, I think of one here by Roger, Roderick Nash called Wilderness and the, Ameri and the American Mind. It first came out in the 1960s, but it's been updated now. Here's a 2001 edition. Uh, it's a fourth edition, and it talks about the dominant cultural values in American life. Largely the use versus preservation is well, where the debate's framed. So this is one that would be a good primer to understand uh, cultural forces that shape our values towards parks. Okay, and as always, I remind everybody, as citizens of the state of Illinois, you have access to our university library and all of these books that yeah. Bill is talking <laughs> about are in our university <laughs> library. There's another one here called R Restoring Nature, uh, Perspectives from the Social Sciences and, and, and yeah. Humanities. It's edited by Paul Gobster, who's up at the yeah, North better. Central Resource uh, Station of the USDA Forest Service, and Bruce Hall, who's a colleague of mine at, at Virginia Tech University. Uh, but there's a number of excellent chapters in here that are written about uh, the social construction of nature and what sort of ideology we're doing when we are restoring natural landscapes. And I personally think that this is the direction that many parks will be moving towards is to, uh, is to restore nature or some way or another humans will be affecting the naturalness of a landscape. Very good. Uh, and I think of Robert Gottlieb's Forcing the Spring, The Transformation of Environmental Movement uh, by Island Press. This is a nice counterpoint to Roderick Nash's Bush uh, book on uh, Wilderness and the, Amer and the American Mind, where Nash lulls you with traditional customary values. Gottlieb sort of hits you in the face with non-traditional values based upon gender, race, and class. And so he problematizes our traditional values and brings out other values that might be out there and helps us to understand uh, what might we might consider as facts that are out there, what is really uh, values that are out, out there that need to be interpreted as such. And the final book I'd like to bring up is On Common Ground Toward Reinventing Nature by William Cronin, who is an excellent historian who's now the uh, Frederick Jackson Turner Chair of American History at Madison, uh, at University of Wisconsin at Madison. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a book by him, by he and his uh, students, who have written about uh, in very insightful and uh, wonderful ways about what nature means to Americans. And there's some, some discussion in there about uh, uh, Frederick Long. Stead's uh, discussion of Boston uh, Fens, Fenways and uh, Central Park, as well as other articles that deal with the way we construct nature and make, literally create value in our landscapes and parks. And just to bring Frederick Law Olmsted closer to home, mm -hmm. uh, for those watching, um, he designed Jackson Park, the Midway, mm -hmm. and Washington Park up in Chicago. Yes, that's true. So um, may not be able to get to Boston to see what Bill just referred yes. to, but we have some of his designs closer to us here in Champaign. Yes, in fact, I might also, just to add to what Patsy is saying there, Hessel Park in Champaign, which is on the corner of Kirby, and uh, it's right across, uh, it, it's, it's, it's close to Kirby and Neal. Hessel Park is designed much like the rooms of Central Park, where you have nine rooms with the one in the center, uh, if you go to Hessel Park, and you will see the various places that are separated by rooms of a park, and it's sort of a grand landscape scale. I didn't know that. Yes. So we both learned today. Right. But the current uh, walk pathway through the park somehow disrupts these rooms from a, a formal sound standpoint, but nonetheless, uh, it, that was the original intent of the design of Hessel Park. So the next time you all go to Hessel Park, think about what Bill just uh, 
mentioned, and Bill has laid out for us very interesting ways to view our two park districts, and as you travel other park districts, you'll see things through lenses that you didn't see before. Thank you for watching, and remember, planning matters.